Hello, I'm Nate, and today for my podcast, I have Azaria, and I'm not going to even pin it down to one kind of, it's just Azaria's story really, it's got a bit of everything in it, so I think the best way that I can describe what this podcast is about is this, is handing over, and it's kind of letting her explain, and then we'll get into other bits afterwards. So yeah, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Azaria to the podcast. No, thank you, mate, thank you for having me. Um, I think we've had a lot of discussions and we've kind of dissected quite a few layers to my story. And I think um, the main themes is understanding how trauma affects mental health and how, you know, the idea of generational trauma and the impact on future children and then what that impact looks like after Mm -hmm. dealing with that and what that consequence is to external factors. So yeah, I'm excited. Thank you again for having me. No, it's all right. How can I not? I think as well, we're going to split yours into two parts as well, isn't it? Like, I'm going to do one part and you're going to go on to the woman's one to do the other part. Um, because, as I said, you've got, there's layers to it. Um, and I don't like saying, you're, it's not really exciting to, to say you've got, got your story, but do you know I mean, it's, it, there is a lot to it. So it's, it's, it's a good subject to talk to. There's lots of uh, angles for it. There's lots of discussions that could be had off the back of it. And, and it should help a lot of people. Um, from where you're, the positions you are in now, like uh, to give you have to, yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Without ranting any more, I'll uh, I'll hand over. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's tell us a bit about your story, like uh, how. Yeah, let's just go from from growing young, shall we? Should we just start from as young as you can remember and go from there? Absolutely. So I remember quite vividly from about the age of about three. Mm-hmm. Um, my childhood being quite chaotic, quite unstable, moving around a lot and pretty much it being engulfed in violence or crime or quite significant events happening either to me or around me um, that I think stuck with me throughout. The only thing that happened to be consistent was this idea of chaos, no matter where we ended up. I am aware of my mother's and my family's history in terms of um, the affiliations and connections with the IRA and how my mother had, from what it sounds like, kind of been groomed into that chaos and that being quite normal for her and then trying to navigate that space after leaving, um, you know, from what I gathered, it, it it sounded like, you know, when she was pregnant with me, there was a lot of violence. Um, mm-hmm. She had got herself caught up in a lot of drug activity that meant her life was in danger. And so was mine being pregnant with me. Um, there were siblings that were before me and I like to try and keep them out of it purely because they, they live a very different life. They've of separated course. themselves massively, but had probably suffered far more than I did, Um, you know, experienced much more violence to higher levels and were then placed in their father's care and and have lived a very happy life since. That wasn't the case for me, unfortunately, or my siblings that came after me. Um, We spent a lot of time running, not understanding what, why our life was like this and almost being quite accustomed to it. So then once I was born, um, I was born in Birmingham, we became at risk, we fled and we moved to London and what should have been the end, it was an opportunity for, I believe, my mum to, you know, look at a new way to live, build a new life for herself. It just felt as though she was so attracted to that chaos that we found it wherever we ended up. So So we ended up in South London it was just a new crowd of people and the same traumas being reenacted you know having those gang members in our home and breaking down drugs and hearing the conversations that were taking place um you know conversations about whether our our door was going to be kicked off because now there are assumptions that my mum is behind these gangs and that just gets into a point where we're no longer scared of all these things we're just hearing it and it's like okay that that's that's become normal the violence um whether it was boys fighting in our home whether it's fighting with our mum fighting with each other or partners it was in almost every aspect and I think then started to spill out in how we were treated um we experienced quite a lot of physical punishment some of which were quite drastic in terms of being hit with pins or being told you'd stand outside naked or being forced to try and strip down it it 
it was it was extreme and I think a lot of that seemed a lot better than what my mother had experienced and therefore it was well I've got to find a way to to be a parent and try not to be the parent that I've experienced yeah. but this is all I've got to give basically um and that just meant we continued to be exposed to trauma throughout um by the time I was five years old I was actually then sexually abused by quite a close relative um who also happened to be involved with the same group, the same organised crime, just the continuance of that terrorist group. Um, and it, for me, it just showed that I think this idea of violence and dysfunction being so normal would ask the question of why a mother would send her child there by herself, knowing mm. the people that I would entail, that I would be connected to, and whilst they were family, the impact they'd had on her. So it, it it was just a continuous cycle. Um, so yeah, it's there, there's so oh, many yeah, places. That's what I'm saying, yeah. So I think what what we can start with is like so. Well, how young was you when you say you first started? I suppose you wouldn't have at this point known that anything was different. But when when's the first sort of criminal activity or something that you knew you can look back on now and think, oh my god, that was weird. Like, was did you remember bits of Birmingham before you moved, or was is it mainly London? London. So from again, from the information, there's so much, um, there are so many discrepancies about whether I was even born in Birmingham. Um, but my birth certificate said I was born there. Mm -hmm. And so from what I gathered from stories that I had been told through other relatives or close family friends, we'd moved to London quite, I was quite young, I would have been less than a year old. So all my memories are London based and start from about being three and from being three mm. I remember living in South London so and it's quite clear quite vivid like things like teachers and yeah. nursery and the clothes I would wear I I can see it's wow. so clear yeah but there are there are some elements of my childhood at like eight and there's just a gap it's a void where I cannot remember certain anything about that period so it's quite odd how the brain retains yeah, that which, kind of information. Especially like three and five, as I said, I've got like his now, and to think if they remembered anything now, I'd be surprised, but let alone like, as I said, but that's what trauma does, isn't it? It kind of, for, that's Absolutely. the kind of definition of it, isn't it? Replaying them dramatic events over and over again. Absolutely, that's it. Um, so I'd say the first thing that I think really made me feel like, okay, this isn't okay, was being maybe six or seven years old I think jewelry was getting robbed from the house it was getting pinned on me the violence was kind of amping up a little bit at home or um it was at that point that I was starting to be left by myself for periods of time with my younger siblings it could be 30 minutes it could be two hours but I would be left and oh, one occasion the house was broken into or they broke into the garden and it was just as she was coming through the door and I'm saying to her there's someone outside and she pulled a taser out of the skirting board and went out there. And it was at that point, it was that, that click Jesus. that made me think, okay, this, this has felt normal. The idea of the violence and stuff like that is normal, but that is risk. And what if, whether it's they had come and hurt us, actually, what if my mom had gone out there and something actually happened to her? Mm -hmm. It was at that point that I think I'd started to look at the life that we're living and not be happy and just think, I need to now act on these feelings that I don't quite understand. And so it was seven, I was about seven years old when I first ran away from home and went to school and said, this isn't, I don't want to be here. I don't feel you like to flee, flee. You normal. went to school to try and say, basically, get me out of home, basically. At seven, that, absolutely. you knew, that you knew to, seven. Jesus. I can't even. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. And the school was in a quick walk either. It was easily about a 20 to 30 minute walk. So how I did oh, it on my own, I still am shocked. <laughs> what, what happened then then? What did the school say after that? Did that, right, did that ring alarm bells for him? Did they know so anything I before? Made disclose, they, they, I'd known there was a few referrals that had been mm -hmm. made. I remember being three and disclosing that, you know, my mum said she's going to hit me with a big stick when I was on it and flush my head down the toilet to see the blue fish. Um, it was no further actions. Um, and then before that, I think I, uh, one of my my brother's teacher had made a referral and just saying, look, I don't think something's right. I'm concerned about the daughter in particular, but they seem very cut off from society. They don't seem to, you know, there's a lot of isolation going on and we're aware that there is violence going on in the home. A lot of the time, I just remember maybe a key worker stepping in and then them disappearing because actually whilst I was a child that 
would be considered very bubbly, very articulate and very smart in school. At home, I was erratic, I was volatile, I was extremely aggressive and was quite out of control from a very young age. It would just be displayed mostly at home. Yeah. So it would come to a shock to professionals when they're hearing this is what's happening. Um, so if we fast forward then to seven, it was then I'd said, she's, she's hitting me. Mm. You know, I'm being left on my own. I don't feel safe. These are the things that I'm seeing. These are the things that I'm hearing. I've got bruises to prove that I'm being here. Uh, there weren't massive bruises, but it was Still, bruises yeah. nonetheless. And I remember the social worker turned up, had a conversation with me and they called my mum. My mum picked me up, took me home. I've gone back to school the following day and said like, you've sent me home and she's done it again. Like I've got new bruises. Like I don't feel safe. I don't want to be at home. And I remember the teacher, the head teacher saying, you're being an attention seeker. Oh my God. I need you to rein it in, go to class, get on with your day. And I think that was the last time I made disclosures to anyone at anything then until I was about 16. That's really I'd kind mad. of shut down. That's because that's what I mean already. There's so much that could have gone right in that situation if it was followed. But like, I know it's, I mean, now I know they're proper, they're, it's a lot, social services are kind of a lot more present. But even you'd have thought back then that that would have been, something that they couldn't ignore for you to be that. I mean, I'm sorry that, you, you, that they said that to you, but that's, that's outrageous to what, how it did you feel? That must've been like a smack to the stomach, like as a kid at seven, knowing that now, what do you feel? How do you feel with seven knowing that happened? It's, it was a rejection. Mm -hmm. And so I think knowing that I hadn't always had everybody that I should have had around me. I didn't have my dad. I didn't mm -hmm. have a big extended family. We didn't have, we kind of had to build our own. And when we did, the minute something went wrong, we're moving and we're cutting ties with people. So it was a rejection because it's taken a lot for me to say, actually, I can't explain why things don't feel right. But this is what's happening. And this is why I feel like this. Yeah. To then be made out to be an attention seeker. Um, and I think at that point, the idea that my mother had started to tell professionals that I was not well and I was a fantasist. Uh... So when I am screaming or repeating things that I'm hearing as a yeah. child that are quite volatile and violent and sh don't come from a child's mouth without it being learned, it's, well, you know, she's not well. She was labelled with mental health problems and epilepsy by the time she was six. So maybe right. it's just a behavioural yeah. thing. There's, the house is decent. They've got nice clothes. The school aren't concerned with her behaviour. So this isn't, um, they, they completely missed the memo. And because there, there is, whilst there is so much history, a lot of that was sealed to such a high level that even if you had her original name change, um, so the name that she had when the history was then created in yeah. terms of the removal of my siblings, the criminal behaviour, you could have the name and you still won't find anything. So there was always that matter that I think from looking at my own records as a teenager, there were professionals saying there's a lot of gaps in this girl's records and there's a lot of gaps in the mm. mother's records but we don't know where to start. Where do we go with that? Even if we've had them, then we've looked, we can't find anything. So what do we go off here? Is is yeah. this just a child acting out? And that's that's how they portrayed it. It was a relationship okay. breakdown yeah. with a young girl who's clearly not okay, but we don't know why. So obviously I take it then that, that continued at home. When it did, did mm -hmm. as you're getting older, it was, was so... You said you had siblings. Was this happening to everyone, or is, or is there was there differences between, or was there any in between in siblings like kind of violence like against each other at any point as well? Absolutely. Um, so a lot of the time, um, I think once my brother was born, I was about four years old at the time, and I just remember feeling like I was adopted or stolen from the hospital, and just felt really disconnected from my yeah. mum, and didn't remember even her really being around so much. I remember being with other people, but being with her, I don't have any core memories of that. And so when my brother came, the relationship with his dad wasn't ideal either, but I don't even remember him being there, mm -hmm. you know? It, so it was neither here nor there. But once he was here and I'd come back home and I'm seeing how she was with him, it was almost like I was just non-existent. And as he got older, it was my mum would say, oh, this has gone missing to my brother. And then my brother would ask him, did you see your sister take it? Did you see your sister do this? And then he would be like, yeah, of course. And not realising now I'm going to get a beating for something that I've either not done or 
he's done and is now looking to blame me. And it started so little at that when we were like six and two and and then seven and nine. But then it got to bigger levels where it was like, okay, your stuff, when I'm mad at you, I will take it and give it to him. Or when he needs something or he says something goes, I will, I'm going to take his side. And a lot of the time he was the golden boy until my mum had three more children. Then the last child then became the golden child. And I think my brother, from what I've gathered, he's done okay for himself. Mm -hmm. Um, I became quite vindictive. And so I'm aware of the, the trauma that as a sibling I've created on them and I'd have to work through with them, given the opportunity to do so. But we we couldn't be close as siblings. My mother had to be in the middle of it. It was, you know, you guys shouldn't be important to each other. I should be the thing that's important to you. And then the older we got, we don't need her more. Another baby comes. And that is, she will look after them until she feels like maybe she's not able to. Maybe something else is triggered inside of her. And then I would take on the responsibility of caring for her, caring for my siblings. Then when I'm not at home, I've got into care or I've left the home for whatever reason, that responsibility then went to my brother who took on a fair amount um, at a young age too. So the impact was, whilst I was the only sibling that experienced sexual abuse Mm -hmm. as a child, we were all exposed to different levels of criminal behaviour. And even to recently, again, it's a new area, a new identity, a new person as as my mum, but she somehow manages to find herself caught up in dysfunctional circles with people. And that then having an impact on my siblings and my siblings' understanding of what is a normal household, what does normal look like, what is safe, what is healthy. they're all now having to go through their own periods of trying to understand what that looks like. And it's very different for me. I think I experienced the most, but they've experienced stuff that I have not yet experienced. Right. Yeah. And no, I get what you're saying. Yeah. So when it went with the sexual assault, was that, did you ever, did, would, obviously the school, you did the physical assault with your, with your mother, but did you, did that ever come out? What What's the story behind that? If you don't mind me asking, like, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so I think there were some questions around my behaviour even prior to the sexual assault. Mm-hmm. Um, there were times where I was described as sexualized from quite a young age, a bit too mature in terms of how I would carry myself, overly friendly as a child, mm-hmm. Would didn't really have this concept of stranger danger. It was, I'd throw myself onto anyone, like as a child who's just free didn't understand any precautions um and then I remember going to see a play therapist at around five or six which would have been around the time that I was sexually assaulted um and nothing ever came of it it was then labeled that this is just a behavioral thing there is nothing Um, that we believe is a concern and it was only when I turned 16 spent a bit of time in and out of care I'd had my first son by this point and we'd got into an argument about something and I'd made disclosure only then and said, this is what I'm, I'm dealing with. You're calling, you're telling me not to be a victim, but I've been a victim my whole life and I don't know how to navigate this. And she never said a word. I said what I said and she didn't say anything. She got up early in the morning, called the social worker and didn't speak about it to me again, like would not bring it up until a couple of years later but then even her perception it was yes this might have happened to you and this explains why you were deranged as she'd like to put but it was okay it's their fault you're this way it's got nothing to do with me and then it's but I remember your cousin being such a he was a lovely boy you know he was he was our golden boy he was so cute and it and it blurs the waters it muddies the water it's almost re-traumatizing for me but I think for anybody who would be in that situation. So so that's kind of what they used again in the school. So because you went through that at a young age, I take it you got into it. And then because there's nothing was found of that then, that's what they used in the school to say that this new event of your mum hurting you is fabricated. Is that fair to say? Yeah. They didn't. So they didn't, because it took so long. So that, that disclosure where I'd run away was seven. That would have been, it would have been nine years later. Yeah when I've now come out of the care system, I've gone back to my mum's and now they're saying, okay, this has happened to you. 
yes it makes sense i think it's now joining the dots but now we just need to make sure you stay in cams and then shortly after that the home environment broke down again and that's when i was assaulted by my mom and then taken out of the home so it's only then that they're starting to think about maybe how that experience would impact me but even then i didn't get a lot of support in making allegation and then what Mm. that process has looked like for me what, what was your opinion of the professionals at a young age then? What what did you think of them? Did you, I suppose, hopeless? I I didn't, I think, as much as I know that my mum lied to me and my mum put me through a lot, everything she said about professionals was the only thing that seemed even relatively accurate. Right. Because from a young age, we were drilled in saying, you don't talk to these people. We don't give a damn. I could be dying. Mm-hmm. And they could be knocking the door and you shut your mouth and you, you you do what I tell you to do. These people can't be trusted. These people won't have your back and support you like they say you will. What they will do is have you tell your whole life story. And the minute they aren't happy with the way your life is going when you're a parent, it then becomes like a loaded gun. You've handed them the ammunition now. They're not going to help you. But if they want your kids, they will take your kids because you've told them everything. Mm-hmm. So... You keep your mouth shut. Mm. And so for a long time, I believed that. I genuinely believed I couldn't have those kinds of conversations with them. I didn't believe they could be trusted. I did think it was just a job to them. And we were just case numbers. It was only after I got to maybe like 19, 20 years old, my children have now been removed from my care. I'm going through the worst possible time in my life. And the only person I had was that one particular social worker who's calling and checking in even when I'm not answering the phone. He's turning up to my appointments with the mental health team and making sure everything's all right. Was the first person there the minute I gave birth and was willing to talk to people. It it took for me to go through so much and that social worker to work so damn hard to unlearn that, yes, not all experiences with social workers are nice. They they aren't great. They, They haven't protected us or served us well, but it's not what we've been made to think it is our whole life it's not it, mm. they're not all out to get us there are some genuinely good social workers who want to do their job i think yeah that's what is it. so when you're going social workers as well it's it's just a common thing isn't it like yeah as you said trying to disclose especially especially you got going on to that going to that bit later but especially with your kids like you as soon as you say the wrong thing or be too honest in a way that i've heard that quite a lot then they'll use that against you so there is certain things. And then if you're not having been able to tell the truth in a situation like that, then you're not really getting the right help because you can't get the right help because you can't no. be telling them what's happening. Well, when you was going, so after that seminar, so going up as a teenager, how, what, what's going on with your life now? Are, are you joining in with this, this gang sort of lifestyle now? Are you still on the outside of it? Are you having issues with your mum still? How's, how's coming into a teenage? Because that's obviously a really crucial part of a woman's life anyway. How was that navigating Absolutely. all of that? It was chaos. I think my body was going through so much mm. already. I think, you know, we, we've got puberty happening. We're going into secondary school. And yeah. I don't even know who the hell I am at this point. It's just, you know, I'm kind of winging it and getting myself into problems, mainly at home. Mm-hmm. It it was this this idea that particularly around that time of the month, I would have quite an extreme outburst mm. where... I'm violent, I will go off for about 12 hours and then I will crash and then it probably ends in me being taken out by police or a social worker being called. Um, But in school generally, um, that was my safe space. That was somewhere for me to go to escape because we weren't really allowed out like that. Yeah, Yeah, and we wasn't allowed out. We couldn't couldn't go nowhere. So we just, that was school was it for me and I love to learn no matter what I I, I d- definitely thrived on learning things and educating myself it's it's my that was my escape to start with and then I think I probably got to about year seven year eight and it's a whole new world like yeah. the stuff that I've been seeing in my home growing up is now in my playground where I'm not being supervised I can just mingle with who I want um I'm getting older as well my responsibilities are ramping up a little bit so mum's now like okay I need you to go to the shop or I need you to go into town get the shopping and I'm seeing that now as freedom a mum might tell me I've got an hour I'm going to take three and I'm going to do whatever the hell I want with yeah. that you know so I'm now meeting a few boys in the area and it's how I met my um, my first boyfriend who we, we went on to have children um 
and so I think my mum had started to suss that something was going on I'm coming back late the beating's not working she'll beat me and tell me don't do x y and z and I'll still do it anyways knowing that these are the consequences but I'm now engaging in risky behavior I, I I no longer have this feeling in my head of there's a consequence to my actions and so I need to watch my actions but yeah I'm just if, if you've had the same consequence for the same time you can get used to the consequence don't you like you kind of you don't not, feel it the same that's not a threat anymore so then yeah so how much trouble did you get in then at this stage <laughs> is this okay. where, where you started kind of rebelling against kind of everything that's kind of happened and started making a kind of fuck you attitude to everybody else I think it was yeah. definitely when I went into care for the first time. So I would I would have right. just turned about 13. And now freedom has gone beyond that. You can't, I know you're not going to beat me. If I don't come home on time, what are you going to do? You All can't right. take my phone. I have to travel from Wood Green to Walthamstow to go to school. So I need my phone. Try and ground me. But if I leave, you can't stop me. Right. So I've already been programmed not to have any respect or any care for you as a, as an authority. Firstly, you've never, you've never helped me. Secondly, I've been told that this is what I can do and this is what you can't do. And actually, my mum's using this as a punishment. So actually, she's doing me a favour because I would have run anyways. But that meant I could go wherever I wanted. I stopped going to school, um, started mixing with my other friends who were meeting up with other people. And I think even at that point, I'd started to kind of dabble in the idea of selling drugs. Mm -hmm but not because I was groomed into doing it. So by this point, the local authority are saying we're now concerned she's been exposed to gang activity and behaviour, but they're worried about it being a part of my school. They, they're they not questioning anything else. My school was heavily gang affiliated. So it goes, well, that makes sense. She's going to that school. That's yeah. where it's coming from. Um, but it was more about, actually, I want a new coat. My foster carer said I've got £100 a month and I'm not getting that, so I'm going to go and get one. I can't be stealing them at the lost property, so I'm going to yeah. do that. I want a new phone. I've got a flip-up phone, and yes, it's serving me, but that's not what I want. And so how am I going to make money? And that was the easiest thing. I could take, I could take a small amount, and I knew just even without my phone, I could go out and double, double my money. It, and yeah. thrive, do what I need to do, not have to worry about the foster care and not giving me my money. I couldn't kind of work that way. And so that had kind of been it for me until I think I'd taken quite a large overdose in care. And once that had happened, my mum threatened to sue them and said she's coming home. And then I went home quite abruptly after my four day stay in hospital. And then from there, I just kind of dabbled in and out of mixing with the wrong people. But I didn't really go back to selling. So I stopped selling drugs from a couple of weeks before I found out I was pregnant. So I would have been about 15. And there was nothing until I lost my kids. And so I would have been about 19, 20 years old. And then I've now regressed and gone back to that behaviour. What, um, what was care like? back then like the foster care did you have the same foster did you get fostered by the, did it multiple families or was it one the same family it was multiple families so I I think gone in for the first time when I was 13 mm -hmm. the last time I went in I was 16 um there are questions around whether some of the places I were before in my earlier childhood stages were some kind of respite or some kind of fostering placements because these are people that I never saw again however there are no records so the records that I do have there was about six or seven different placements between 13 and 16 and then spouts of home in between and they were all different so so extreme the first one I went to was beautiful lovely I only stayed there for two weeks second one I went to the home was poor it was really cold didn't have heating couldn't run a bath there wasn't food in the oh, fridge right. and and the woman just ate Chinese all the time at like 11 o'clock at night so didn't really care where I was either until right workers now saying you need to rein it in you need to at least try and keep her at home or get her into school um and so I left that placement um went back home then I went to another placement and it was the first placement that I think I'd started to kind of feel a bit comfortable we were moved to, I was moved to Harrow and 
it was a mum and a dad. They'd had their own kid, really lovely woman, and really took the time out because I'd made it real difficult, ran away from the first time I got there. You know, my self-harm episodes were quite, had ramping up by then. So it was a lot. And she took a lot of time out. She had a lot of patience for me and worked really hard at trying to get me into doing things that I want to do to keep me off running the roads and getting myself caught up in things. It was, well, you know, you can sing. Let's get you into some of the summer university Mm -hmm. courses that are going. Let's get you doing things that you want to do. But that summer holiday where I'd run away shortly after attending placement, I'd got pregnant. So whilst things were happening musically, I was getting opportunities once I'd found out I was pregnant. All of that kind of went down the drain. And then my mum had said they were going to make me terminate the baby, um, told me that they were prepping me for a termination, whether I wanted one or not, and withdrew me from care again. So it was just a, a mixed experience. I think I had some relatively good ones, but the, the consistency wasn't there. I, it and, must and feel horrible, like, going through that many families, because, like, where do you feel like you belong? Especially if you're going back home in this as well. Like, you're just going from family to family to family to family, back home, family to family, family. Like, your sense of belonging, your sense of stability to even then think about stuff, what you're going to do in your future, what I want to be in the future. I couldn't, like, I'm putting it in my head, and I couldn't think, because you can't, because if you've got no stability, you can't think of, right, I'm going to get these GCSEs, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to do this, because you're everywhere. You don't even know where you're going to be next week. That must have been awful, like, growing up, like, that sort of... It, it was so normal. Well, I mean, it, yeah. when when I look back at when I look back as an adult and think, okay, that was a lot. I can see it, but at the time, it just felt so normal. It just felt like an adventure. It just oh, felt. I think that's why I couldn't settle. I couldn't settle anyway because I had been so used to moving mm. around or being running from something or someone, whether it was my fault, my fault or not. I was so used to running that even now as an adult. I have to try and control this itchy feet right, narrative. Yeah. It's it's like, okay, do we need to, why, why do we feel like we need to run? Yeah. It, this is a mental thing. This, we don't need to run anywhere. But it, it was so normal. It was so normal that, yeah, stability now is something that I have to still get accustomed to. It's, it's still something I'm trying to be comfortable with. So in it, you're going in that care. So then I take it you've met, you said you met your boyfriend. So what age was you when you got, you, you got pregnant the first time? So when I got pregnant the first time, I was about five months by the time I'd actually found oh, out Jesus. I was pregnant. I, day after my, my 16th birthday, oh. gone a bit crazy, you know, pulled a bit of a whitey, gone home to my foster care and she was like, I'm taking you to hospital because this is a bit much. And they've told me I was pregnant and I'm like, oh, you're lying. I don't, I don't believe you. <laughs> I think your test is faulty and I don't believe you. I, do I look pregnant? <laughs> I, I'm not pregnant. There's, there's just no way. It's not making sense. But I was, and when I'd spoken to him, he didn't want any parts. He just said, you don't tell anybody that baby's mine. Want nothing to do with the situation. By that point in my head, I it was a rejection. Yeah. And so instead of me being upset about it, it was, well, I don't need you anyways. I was going to raise this child by myself. I know what I want mm-hmm. to do, and this is how I'm going to do it. Um but I think in hindsight, there wasn't a lot of time either. I ha- it was a matter of days. I was told you've got three days to decide if you're keeping or you're not. Three days. Because then three days. Pressure. You don't, it, 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 it's already like a really on, like, like an over the top pressurized situation anyway. To have like, oh, okay, you found out, now you've got three days to get through. I wouldn't even be able to get through the, the, the fact that you was, let alone a decision of what's going to happen next in three days. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And as a child, these are grown folk decisions. Yeah. Our brains are not, uh, we're not, we've not got the tools and the resources to really think and, and make decisions. And, and I don't think that should be a choice in, in necessarily saying that young girls shouldn't make these decisions. But I think they need to in, be fully equipped. I should have had that termination counselling. I should have been able to have conversations with everybody in my yeah. network to be saying this is what, these are my options. This is what I'm concerned about. These are my triggers. This is what, you know, I'm, I'm battling with in terms of making a choice in order for me to make a better choice. Because as much as I love my son, I did him a disservice because I did not understand what motherhood was going to bring to me mentally. That was a whole yeah, different... Course. A, a whole different Pandora's box that opened up the minute I became a mum and then trying to manage that with this, like this mask on, pretending everything's all right, pretending I'm good and 
to the rest of the world, it seems like I'm doing well. I, he was nine weeks old. I've gone back to school. I've gone to a community college to get my childcare qualifications. Social work has got no problems. My son doesn't have a social worker. I have a social worker because I'm a kid in care, but my kid's not a kid in care. So things are looking good, but yeah. what was going on in my brain didn't really kick in for people until my mother assaulted me. And then I've ended up in temporary accommodation. And then people are saying, well, maybe there's something not right. I, I, don't, I don't know, but we'll see what happens. And it, that's how it was for, for quite a few years after that. So you've had so you've had the kids and then so you've gone back home after the care had you've got the child at this point and then this is where you've really had a falling out with your mum and is this is this is this the police was the police involved in this one is this this the, is this the second time that you've reported yeah this kid? was the second yeah. time and there were superficial injuries so whilst the injuries were life threatening by any mm. means it was clear by the cuts and the grazes on my face. And I think there was quite a bit of redness on the back of my head where she had caught me. And I'm saying to them, like, yeah, take her because I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. And by the time she's come, the police have got there. She's locked me outside and I can't even get indoors. So once the police have come, she scratched her neck. And then yeah. as they've opened the door, you just see all these marks. And she's saying, she, like, she's done this to me. And I'm say, I remember begging the police officer saying, take me with you do forensics i i wanted to at one point i wanted to be a forensic scientist so i know what i'm talking about taking me to the station and take the dna from under my finger and i did not touch her i, I i'm not gonna have anybody lie on my name anymore like yeah. I, that was the point it was not, not even so much that she did what she did it was the fact that she was lying that triggered me so much i, I remember the social worker at the time just saying it's not worth it let's get what we can and we'll, we'll figure out the rest and they never pressed charges. They put it down to a domestic dispute um, and a relationship breakdown. Um, and that caused more problems because my mum was still dealing drugs at this point. And she got into a van with um, quite enough to, for intent to supply. <laughs> so it's now caused more problems because I'm not only the bad guy because I've now gone against the grain. I've gone against the code and I'm calling police oh, on God, people. Yeah. But my mother as well, my mother of all people, <laughs> And knowing how that was going to impact the kids and knowing the messages they were going to get about me the minute she got out was a lot. I knew I was going to be in for a ride and I didn't feel able to verbalise that actually this was a lot for me. Like these are the things that's going on in my head. I'd already, I'd only just made my disclosure about the sexual assault as well. So everything was coming at me hot and heavy. Yeah. It was it was a lot. It was mm. it was too much for for any child. It was too much. Hope so. You had no. So what are the social workers doing? So they, are they what are they doing to help you in your situation? Like after after the police involved with your mum. So where did you go after this? Um. So a conversation was had yeah. with me about the fact that they wanted to put me back into care. Right. And I said to them, okay. I'm happy to go back into care if you can guarantee that I'm going to stay there until I'm 18. Because the whole reason why I left in the first place was because the foster carer was no longer happy with the placement. Because I was doing so well, she felt I would be better off going into semi-independence. Right. And I'm saying to them at that point, yes, I cook, I clean, I manage my money, I take care of my baby, I study, I'm not ready. I don't feel ready. Again, communication breakdown. Nobody's, there, there are no social workers involved in this conversation. It's just me and the foster carer. So I'm now taking that conversation back to my mum and she's saying, well, if they're going to kick you out and you're not ready, you've got to come home. Like, that's the only option. This time, I, I, but we was under the agreement that before that point, I would be allowed to stay until I was 18. Then at 18, get my place, no problem. Yeah. This time they said, we can't guarantee you'll get your stay. It could be a couple of weeks and then we might have to find you somewhere else. And I'm saying to them, well, I don't want to do that. Mm. like you're going to move me there to get attached to people to and then you're going to move me again i am not in a position to do that so if you can't guarantee it just put me in the hostel from now it was like okay no problem we'll do that let's put you in the hostel put me in temporary accommodation um i believe the one of the social workers that at the time that was helping my social worker was really good took toasters and kettles out of the office to make sure we had stuff in this hostel that was the size of a box um and really looked out for me so i can't fault her for i guess doing what she thought was best mm -hmm. with a, a a child who's a parent who's going through so much um but i did 
didn't feel like after that it was more about okay I'm now running you down to deal with my taxes my because my council tax is coming I've got a bill of a thousand pounds but I'm not even 18 so I can't yeah like I don't understand what what there was so much that you just as a child yes I grow up quite quickly there were so many things I didn't really understand and I wasn't getting that support just for the basics let alone the demons I'm now battling with um so we just kind of ended up on a downward spiral. I've gone to school, got my GCSEs, gone to a community college. And the minute my partner, my ex-partner had come out of prison, we'd gotten back together. So I would have been about 17 at the time now. And if it weren't already terrible in terms of where my mental frame of mind was at, where I was just trying to balance being a mum and a student and a person, mm it just got 10 times worse from there. Oh, I mean, geez, that's what I'm saying already. Like, there's so many. There's, how no one has fought and intervened and helped you, like, is in the sense of a social worker, you've got, like, that safety net around you. Um, Just a quick one before we get into that thing. Do you think the social worker work would be, if you went through that, all of this now, do you think it would still fail? You would still get failed? Or do you think that it, the times have changed enough now from what you know and what you've seen? I think they'd still fail. You think? I, I, I think they'd still fail. I think there's been too many cases where even just on a real surface level, I think they would let things go on for as long as they did. I do think they would try to intervene. Yeah. But I think the structures is the problem the social workers themselves aren't actually the problem it's the structure yeah, of I, I, services I because that. if you're telling me that your structure is when a child is placed on child protection you guys are having a conference and a legal planning meeting which has now said we have enough evidence and enough probable cause to go and get an interim care order for children who we believe are at risk and still don't do that because you don't feel like it's going to be worth it's legally and financially it, it might not be conducive yeah. that shows that there's a problem with the structure not with the people yeah. like if a structure says this is what needs to happen it shouldn't be well if money allows like it needs to be it these things need to be looked into yeah. it shouldn't have to take all of that before people say all right let's try and invest better resources into children or into families and get the bigger picture if we're concerned that records are being sealed or gapped because I know that there are after speaking about it there are quite a few have had similar experiences to me I just think how do we then balance that that then takes it to a governmental level that takes it above structure and we're now talking about governmental <laughs> policies yeah. here I, and they're not going to want to do that because again it's not in the country's yeah. best interest so there are going to be many many individuals like myself that will play scapegoat to not just a country because that's what we're talking about here in order for you to safeguard a country you would held information that did not protect me or my siblings that still doesn't protect my siblings so we're talking about changes here that would probably mean abolishing the government as yeah, it is yeah yeah that's just awesome, starting isn't it? all yeah. over again and I, I, unfortunately, as much as I am very optimistic, I'm not sure we're going to be able to I mean, do that. I mean, do, yeah, it, it is. Uh, as there's a lot of feels, that, uh, isn't it? You get to a certain point of it and you think, oh, it's not going to go that far. <laughs> like, it's not a simple no. change. It's like, this has got to change and this has got to change and that means that's got to change. You're just looking at it hopelessly like, that's not going to change. <laughs> no, it's not going to work. Yeah. Exactly. What, exactly. Where, um, so you said your life was like going bad after you got back with, with your ex after you come out of prison. How bad? Mm -hmm. what happened so after him being released from prison it was less than four weeks later he was back on the run for breaching his license and so whilst at that point I had made a decision that we were going to um I'd made a decision that we were going to take our time because he was on the run he had no choice but to move in because there was nowhere else for him mm -hmm. to go so now I'm watching my back and God. his infidelity was kicking in quite early on into the, um, quite early on into the relationship re restarting. So that was an issue. I already, by that point, I would have considered myself a firecracker. I didn't take a lot of things lying down. So if you shout at me, I'm going to shout back. Mm. You put your hands on me, 
chugs like, I'm going to put my hands on you back because I'm, I've dealt with this for too long. I'm not a victim. I don't do yeah. victim. That was the frame of mind for me. However, I'd gotten pregnant so quickly with my second that it was almost like, I'm scared social's going to get involved again. He's on the run. We're fighting all the time. Like, it's it's not good for the kids. And now i am now got to protect the baby that I'm carrying. By that point, I was hoping it would de-escalate the arguments when in fact it made them worse so when i wasn't responding he became much more violent or when i wasn't fighting back he would double down on his aggression and began using where it was like a push or a shove or you know trying to get me out of the way it became a punch holding a knife to my throat you know Mm -hmm. trying to bury my head underwater while i'm in the bath or knocking me out or trying to push me down the stairs it's just it, it it had gone from what could just be a tussle to just full blown violence. Yeah. And by then I'm kind of I've got my mum again, she's still in the picture, saying, Well, you're just as bad as him. So just and actually what yeah. I went through with your dad, you know, she had told me my whole life that my own father was incredibly abusive, incredibly violent. And that's turned out that that story wasn't necessarily true but she would always use those experiences of my father quote unquote being so violent that my experiences had nothing on hers and so I just kind of needed to get it on like I need to get on with it and I need to sort myself out because I'm the problem so was this happening to you while you were pregnant so the the, the abuse so you say I so you kind of changed the way that you would respond to this because you was pregnant, but and then that's when it escalated into something that's obviously got much worse and worse and worse. So that must have been frightening Absolutely. in itself, just knowing that you're protecting not just yourself, but protecting like someone else as well. Absolutely. I, I, at that point, I, I think this, the fear was debilitated to a point where I kind of just disassociated. Mm-hmm. I, I don't remember a lot of my pregnancy. Right. I don't remember it. Like I remember my first I remember my third and I remember my last daughter but particularly with my second daughter there are a lot of gaps in my memory with the pregnancy and a lot after I had her that I just can't tap into or people will say oh do you remember when this and that happened and I'm like I've got no recollection of that whatsoever like it's just not there Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so it, it it I don't know if it was the fact that I think particularly with narcissists, they feed off of, you know, a reaction. Mm-hmm. And so because I wasn't giving that, it, it would just send him mad. Or if it felt like because our relationship was based so much on such a high level of aggression, which can sometimes be referred to as passion. Once that's gone, it's almost like we're affiliated love with violence. So when the violence is no longer there, this person don't love me no more, which is... You don't care because you're not responding. You can't, you can't be bothered to argue back. Whereas, yeah, I can see Right. That. And actually, my brain hasn't gone there. My brain is saying, I can't, I haven't got the energy physically to do this with you. And actually, I'm scared. Either I'm going to kill you by accident or you're going to kill me and this baby by accident. Yeah, so yes. even if it's not a physical premeditated plan to hurt one another, someone's going to end up dead in this situation. And I now I'm trying to protect this baby and he just couldn't he he has his own issues with mental health i know he had asperger's and he'd struggled and had his, so many experiences of trauma quite early on that now looking back now that i've navigated this space i find it very hard to feel anger towards someone's actions because it kind of when i look at his life and i look at mine uh, they're very similar and it kind of just highlighted that actually we went down the same road and there were points he was a victim and he became my perpetrator. But then I'm sure that whilst I may not have been the worst perpetrator to some people, I know I often get told, it wasn't that bad what you did. Mm -hmm. It's not the point. My path led me down a path where I became a perpetrator to other people. That may have been my siblings. It may have been my mum at some point. It would have been friends, it could have been partners. I think even my own children would have suffered a certain level of neglect emotionally before physical, purely because of my experiences. Yeah. And I think it then gives you an idea of not that we, we, we ignore the behaviour of people who abuse, but we start to take a look a bit further back in understanding that at any point we could have or we could be 
on the other side and be the abuser if trauma yeah. allowed it. I think I've I've had discussions about it before, and as I said, it's either one way or the other. It seems like, isn't it? But you you become the victim yourself, or you become the perpetrator, um, or as I said, you could be a bit of both. Where, yeah. where, why do you think that is? Do you think that looking back, there's a point that you could intervene, or there's something that could be put in place to kind of fizzle that out? Because there's, surely there's got to be a, a point where you could like if when you know that someone's gone from abuse surely you need to step in then and if you know that's the two outcomes it's it's kind of baffling that they don't do nothing to intervene isn't it before no it's like as you said I, they wait for, for something to happen knowing that it's going to happen but instead of, kind of right. directing it at that point when they can you know i think I, the problem is is they wait until they have the most damaging evidence mm -hmm. which is always incredibly hard and i think when we're dealing with coercive behavior which i would say a lot of that would have been experienced by my mother mm -hmm. um in her childhood i think knowing that she would have been groomed and molded into being the woman that she had become involved to quite high levels in things that she probably would have you would have never have imagined as a child that's not the things you wake yeah. up one day and say ah that's who i want to be when i grow up no no child would do that yeah. unless that behavior is normalized or unless that has been something that's glamorized it just depends on the person's path but i think instead of looking at that i think services do need a better understanding of emotional abuse effects on the brain and effects on the family generally i think narcissistic abuse is another thing that we talk about a lot yeah. but i think there needs to be far more training because once we have that information through social care providers we better equip children if you are asking for children to make disclosures and you are saying that it is on the child because there is nothing you can to do until the words come out of their mouth we have a duty then to equip the children with not only the information, but the confidence yeah. and the safe space to allow that. We, 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 what we're saying is if we know abuse is happening at home or they are being exposed to behaviours or criminal activity that now has traumatised them and is now impacting them, you're asking the impossible of the, you're asking the impossible of parents. They can't even identify their own traumas. You know, yeah. unless they've done the work. Yeah. So it's got to come from outdoors. It has, has to come to. from outside of the home. Yeah, that, as I said, it has to be intervened, doesn't it? Because yeah, that's a very good point that you don't know how, and that could have degenerate. That could have gone just generation up, generation to generation. It could just be domestic Absolutely. abuse through the family, so it's, it is normalised to the next level of normalisation. So you're never going to spot a problem it, until it's kind of too late, isn't it? Until something or, or tragic's happened or something really, really awful has happened and then that someone steps in and says well we knew this was going to happen but you know it shouldn't have and it's a, but it's kind of too late by that point isn't it so that you you've already Absolutely. there's so many points that through through your story just up to the point of 16 where you could have got help they could have I would like to have thought that they kind of would have took you away understood what was going to go and happen and took you far away from that kind of situation but it seemed even the fact that you was allowed to go back and forth between the foster care system into the parent system is like that's that's crazy like because if that's where you're from I mean. in the first place, how can you just then say that I can go back there at some point and then come back? Like it's, it's mad. It baffles me. This is it. I think their understanding was that I think because they'd spent so time, so much time trying to label what the concern was, mm -hmm. it clouded the judgments of all other authorities that would get involved. So right. it was this is a relationship breakdown. Mum mm -hmm. and daughter don't get along mum has mental health daughter has mental health issues this is obviously just a concoction of madness so when you look at it like that mm -hmm. I, I kind of understand it it's okay well so whilst it's not working we'll keep her and then the minute mum kicks up a fuss and actually they had failed so many times i think the first time i had taken an overdose in placement you were aware that i was high risk of overdose and self-harm how have i been able to get hold of pills that aren't mine when you know I'm on suicide watch, you know that I'm a risk to self. So that was a failing. And I think my mum, you would use that to her advantage. It's you've already messed up here. So I know I still have some of my parental responsibility. If I remove my child and you decide to come at me, I will make this a public matter and yeah. let the news outlets know that my child was failed in the system. And no one wants, the reality is the minute authorities and directors hear that, whether there is any probable cause to what parents are spouting, a lot of the time they're going to run from it because they don't want 
the local authority in the newspaper for these kinds of stories. Yeah, unfortunately, I've come across that, like being like when I've been doing management and stuff for like that with certain degrees, isn't it? When it comes push comes to shove, they're not going to want to smoke, so they just kind of, kind of, yeah, they back off, back off completely. What so what? What sort of thing? So I know you're so from this. It's not all you've kind of you've kind of really, I would say, really positively come out of this somehow. I mean, I don't know how. <laughs> we're up to sixteen. Um, that's what I'm saying. You've done amazing too, for like to be in the position you're in now. But like, so what is it that your 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 what is what's it led you to? So all of this in your life, like your childhood now. What is it that you're doing now? What how's that how's that affected what you do now? And how are you living life from that now? Does that make sense? absolutely um so it's been it's been a long ride yeah. it's been a lot of, it's been a lot of unlearning and relearning and rewiring i think i'd say that this process really started for me when i got pregnant with my third child because mm-hmm. i fell pregnant very quickly and in the circumstances like that it, it can really muddy the water when you've got we've got children already in care and we're under an interim court order as well. So, you know, decisions are being thrown around. And so it was only after I've lost two children and now fighting for my third and I had a brilliant social worker, a brilliant solicitor, Mm -hmm. fought my case tooth and nail, sat in front of a panel quite unprepared Mm -hmm. um, and fought my case and managed to get me into a position where I could access the therapy that I need. I think it also took for authorities to actually stand up for me and say that relationship with your mum is toxic. It's always been toxic. She's never been able to, you know, protect you or safeguard you as a child. And even as an adult, she's still making decisions that put you in jeopardy. And then being firm about that and saying there is no in between. Yes, she's your mum, but you want a parent you're gonna have to sacrifice so much to be a parent you know you have to be willing to to do things differently you're willing to to learn new behaviors put in the work for them and cut people off that you know don't mean you any any good Mm -hmm. anybody who could put you at risk and so it took a good five years I got pregnant with my fourth child in the middle of that so I thought it would throw a spanner in the works when actually it just pushed us in a better direction. We'd gone to court after my daughter. Um, you can there hear you in the are. background, yeah. <laughs> giving us, giving us ad um, But yeah, they discharged it. And then once I'd had my order discharged from my son, I began doing, um, I'd studied child psychology and then began my journey as a lived experience consultant, Brilliant. offering training and advice and, doing a little bit of poetry because it's therapeutic good for the soul um and just finding my way i guess to rewire this system i can't do it on my own but i can i can leave um um, a footprint in the in in the system and that's the plan i I feel like yeah in that situation i feel like all we can do is set up the next generation and give them as much as information as we can can't we and i do have kind of faith like i do think obviously you've got like young kids now as well and i do think the time they get to 18, the way that things are going, is anything even going to be an issue? Mental health. We're talking about mental health, but we're, we've got to the point now, very quickly, we can talk about mental health from when we couldn't. Like, I've been, right. I'm a, I've been a, alive in that life, lifetime. Um, even like you get like all of <laughs> like, the gay rights and stuff like that. I do feel that yeah. they have got the perfect, when it comes to this sort of thing, if there is going to be a change in the system, it's going to be the, the next gen, couple generations where... I don't know what, because the way that it's worked and the way that we've got the structure, something might have to change as in like the government structure. It might have to be a big reform, but they will get there because there is a lot more care and people are asking those questions a lot more now, aren't they? And kind of, and social media as well has been a big tool that you could use for this. Like, Absolutely. even if like you had TikTok back then and you even said, imagine say, you, you probably get more of an audience saying that, oh, guess what just happened to me then? And you, someone would have to listen then through TikTok. Do you know what I mean? Like, and they have so tools viral. now where certain degrees of it can't be ignored and stuff like that. What is it that you start? What work is it that you're you're, you're working on at the moment? So, what kind of things is it that you're trying to change or would think that you need to change? Um, so, one of the big things that through um, my lovely parent panel group that I am a part of through the Family Rights Group is looking at how families are supported to keep their children, um, mm-hmm. how that process looks. As you're aware, when your children are removed, it is court proceedings, it is, you know, standing in front of a judge and trying to fight your corner and 
from what we've gathered, there are now um, quite a few political individuals who are interested in reforming the family proceedings and what that looks like to create a a, a much stronger multi-agency approach when it comes to rallying around parents yeah. to try and keep their children where possible and also trying not to make this experience as traumatic as it is mm-hmm. if a child can't be at home that is the most heartbreaking thing for a mother for a father for the child and i think for any human being who is a social worker or a judge would see that as heartbreaking themselves whether they know what that feels like so that has brought about a lot of work um being a part of family proceedings reform group um being able to work with professionals and train on the importance of utilizing particular services um using my experiences to shed light on coercive and controlling parenting complex gang and drug dynamics within individuals Mm. particularly young people and the other aspect of the mental health diagnosing system you know i was labeled as personality disorder something that is lifelong something you don't get rid of and yeah. that i think changed the, the trajectory of so much within me and um myself and actually how i was then portrayed so it was only when that diagnosis was removed it made me think how many other parents are being diagnosed with something that's considered lifelong and then they end up completely I went, I'd taken away from that yeah. diagnosis but are still left with the, the long-term consequences of being labeled with such a, um, a term so being able to share those experiences to be Brilliant. able to talk yeah. to professionals has been amazing so that's that's as i said that's really good that you've that you've kind of turned it i think that that's amazing that you're, you've got so much knowledge and i hope that you'll be able to do it touching on to the court reforms i said that's the perfectly line up to the the second episode that we're going to do with Hannah talking about that as well, because that, that's something personal to Hannah. And I think that'd be a great conversation you two having on that. But on, the, on the whole, do you think, where do you think, where do you see us going forward? Going, in the sense of, I feel like it, we need to take the power back into our hands, don't we, when it comes to... Uh, I don't know. To, I don't know the right word in a bit without being too controversial. <laughs> yeah. Listen, a bit of controversy never hurt nobody. Hit us. With I thought it. that, yeah, but you say that, and then you could write it in too controversial. I got to add it on TikTok, and they're like, "You can't say that." Like free speech, <laughs> right? You can't really. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, I got done that. But so what? What? Without saying it, well, because it is shit. The system is still shit. What is? Uh, Mm-hmm. We, I feel like the only way that we're going to get rid of the system is similar to you is, is that we're going to have to rebuild it from the the, the, the the top down like really just go from mm-hmm. the beginning because off the back of obviously what you've gone with your things I have not obviously not children removed and that but just being a single dad I've had my own issues about what kind of access and what that means as a single dad so I'm I'm very aware about when the how far processes are backwards as in how how far they haven't looked at anything how much society's changed since then and how much it needs they need to hurry up it's almost like that we've all kind of woken up and gone we're here now and they're still all the way back there like the ba- the days of the beginning of like a, a dad now in like the way i see it is, is just being that dad that doesn't want to do anything and it just doesn't pay csa it's so far from that dads want to be involved now dads are about they, that stigma's gone Absolutely. But the court system is set up to tell you that's not the case and that dads will are still are their danger and they haven't got rights that it's not equal no matter what we say on paper it, do, do you know what it's it's so bizarre because don't get me wrong, I know that there are a lot of good fathers mm. who are having to fight tooth and nail and and overturn so many negative labels and stigmas. Yeah. But I I I have a very different opinion. I do. And I think it's that they tend to focus so much on the wrong things, then get it wrong, and then try to impose their findings onto other individuals. Right. So we are seeing and hearing continuous stories about whether it's mothers or fathers who have been concerned about physical abuse with children or you know family members that are putting the children at risk the courts have allowed access and have allowed you know allowances no matter what because this person is an immediate family member more often mums or dads and then we have other circumstances where there isn't enough evidence and we're seeing that 
actually there isn't enough evidence to penalise this parent the way opposing parent is, you know, bring, putting them across. And yet they are the ones that are struggling to see their kids or, mm. you know, the, par- the mothers who come across as the victim are actually the ones now controlling the narrative. Yeah. It's it's yeah. it's such a it's it's a fine line between being an abuse being an abuser and being a victim. And I think many a times why professionals come down quite hard on mothers, whilst I don't agree with it, being a mother who was a victim of all kinds yeah. of abuse, it was torture hearing them come down so hard on me. But I think being able to see how everybody else's trauma has led them to be who they are mm. it should show we we need a map we there is there is a matter of urgency here yeah. on how we now manage families and the stigma that comes about surrounding abuse we need to start paying more attention yeah, to psychological abuse we also need to start paying attention to things like reactive abuse a term that isn't often used because normally what's wrong is wrong and what's right is right but if you are being abused a lot of children, young people or partners will be tested to points where they then become an yeah. abuser, which then has a negative impact, not just on the individual, but everybody involved, particularly where there's children involved. So we are going to have to get real honest, I think, as a society about the roles we play in our individual worlds, mm-hmm. in our jobs, with our children, with everybody else's children. I think we need to get very transparent and understand that, yes, these these structures are here to, to protect us. They're not doing a good job of it, but we also have a part to play, whether we are the victim or not. Mm-hmm. We have to start looking at our worlds, our, our, our circumstances, and looking to find a way to make those changes. Yeah. If we know we lack somewhere, we need to be able to go and find that information whether it's through other parents a therapist everybody's process is different but until we as individuals start taking accountability for the parts we play in society in our families Mm -hmm. even if they threw 10 billion pounds at the social care system and debunked it and and tried to reform it we'll have the same issues yeah we'll still have the same issues it's a collective and, and it always will be whether we like it or not in order for this to work we're going to need to start from scratch and we're going to need to view them more as allies than enemies yeah. but that yeah. is something that takes them working with yeah. us as well it's not just it, it's a give and take and it has to be yeah no definitely i, I it's going to be interesting if you see the next uh, the next few years to see at least especially what's going on at Absolutely. the moment with our rishi sunak and it, oh. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know how far we're gonna get. Um, no, no it is it, it's... mental health hasn't been a priority. Either. No, it, mental health hasn't been a priority for a lot of the politicians. I think trauma and the impacts of trauma, particularly on the the physical aspects, when somebody's experienced so much trauma, we are seeing how that's impacting people's ability to work, yep. to parent, to function. And I think until political parties understand that the investment, particularly in our younger generation now, is going to be the key on how far we're able to move, we're, it's going to take us a minute. Yeah. It's going to take us a, minute, yeah. a lot longer than it would need to, in fact. It is. I do, as I said, though, but ultimately, I do feel like we are on the right path. And I think the generations, they'll do something will happen. If it's a complete and out of riot, like or something <laughs> down the years, there I will don't, be I an uprising. Years or uprising or something kind of anonymous film or something. There will be, but something <laughs> is going to have to do it because, there, it, as I said, it's just there's loopholes and you can play the system both sides. I do feel there's a bit that they're not doing as well. I feel that they should, and I know they don't have time for, it, and they're going to say it's down to funding. But every case should be individualised, as in every case should go to trial, as in an actual case shouldn't be used about past, Absolutely. or you couldn't put you shouldn't put into a box because oh domestic abuse here, blah blah blah. Everyone, and this is what they miss. Every story is going to be different. You can't just say, oh, that's similar to that one. That must be happening. It, every, you have to initiate everything no. as a story, and they don't, do they? It's very. No. It's okay, right? We're in this. We're going down this path, and then oh, that's happened. It's this path, and you don't get a fair trial. Is in it, it, it's as a personalized story, isn't it? You're just put in a box of of like trauma, or this is what's happened. It's not like you don't feel coming out of that situation. They, you're they, not they, they're going to remember you. Yeah, you, you're just you, you, you're even part of their them their memories. That you're not just a part like as you said, like a box that they're just ticking and putting into like a number. Absolutely, absolutely, and and that will be their biggest mistake because 
I know when I uh, when you go through this process, you, we had multiple assessments, mm. and a lot of them were saying the same thing, mm. like even down to what could have been a positive. Them saying, "Look, she needs oh. two years like of therapy, and she mm. needs this, and she needs that before she'll be in any position." Mm. And actually, I needed five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I needed about yeah, yeah. five years. But actually, the trajectory has been far better than I think what was anticipated mm-hmm. because actually, I was treated as a human, not as a uh, you know a statistic, yeah. not as oh that case from nineteen ninety seven that sounds so similar. It, it yeah. I was a human, but it took a lot of work, and it took for professionals to also hear some things that. They didn't like, they didn't want to hear, and they needed to understand you have a part to play as to why I'm here, mm-hmm. whether you like it or not. And you have a certain level of accountability that, in, you know, you owe me mm-hmm. because the, you could have done, done things differently. And if you want this to work and we have to build a certain level of trust here in order to make this work, that's going to involve you guys wanting to unlearn what you've been taught to. And I give them credit because it was the longest. I think my son would have been five by the time we had discharged. It was the longest five years of my life. I did not feel like my life was my own, but with a bit of help yeah. and a bit of, you know, advice, I think we managed our corporate co-parenting dynamic relatively well. That's it. That's it. That's it. Relatively yeah. well. No, but that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, that's as much, this is kind of, I, I, I want to get the first one to go post the other thing, but I said the second episode you're going to do with Hannah is going to dive into them more into the, the, the restrictions and the social the social services and what happens with a kid and also what can happen when you do be too honest um, with a, with it. And, and I think it, that's going to be a very interesting episode. And there's only so far I can go with them kind of conversations. As I said, I've got a different experience right. being a single dad as well as and stuff like that. But it was yeah. lovely listening to your story and everything like that. I, I honestly, I still don't know how you're so... I, I didn't even have an excuse and I kind of went down a similar path. Like, there's no one... <laughs> I had no excuse and no one was going to get out of it. I was just in my own head. So the fact that you've come out of that, you know, you've got you've obviously got one of your beautiful children there. Like, um, yeah. yay! Um, and, and you're doing something for change. is powerful. And I think it's very good to know that it's that someone that's gone through it is going to make the change because I think this is what we're missing. <laughs> 